Hello and welcome. In this video, we will discuss the important topic of hormonal therapy prescribed during menopause. Having knowledge about hormonal therapy allows the gynecologist to play a crucial role in helping women navigate the physical and emotional changes associated with menopause. It helps the women to make informed decisions about their care and optimize their quality of life during this stage of life. In this video, we will discuss different forms of hormonal therapy, their method of delivery, dosage regimen, the indications, the contraindications, talk a little bit about the Women's Health Initiative and how it has influenced our current body of knowledge, the Million Women Study from the United Kingdom, transient adverse effects and uncertain effects of hormone therapy. So before we start, please subscribe to this channel so that we can continue to give you high quality videos which will help you in your professional life. So the first question is that what are the forms of hormone therapy and let's go through them one by one. So hormone therapy can be prescribed as a local treatment in the form of a cream, pessary or ring or as systemic therapy in the form of oral drugs, transdermal patches, gels, and implants. With transdermal preparations, the liver is bypassed and the serum levels of hormones are predictable and optimal. Hormonal products which are available in such preparations may contain the following ingredients. Estrogen alone, or combined estrogen and progesterone, or selective estrogen receptor modulator, or CERM, or gonadomimetics such as tibolone, which contains estrogen, progesterone, and an androgen. The different schedules of hormone therapy can include the following. Either women will take an estrogen on a daily basis, in the form of transdermal patches, gels, or even orally, or they may take it as a cyclic or sequential regimens in which progesterone is added for 10 to 14 days every four weeks. Or continuous combined regimens in which estrogen and progesterone are taken daily. The different forms of, uh, of, uh, uh, of estrogens which are uh, present in the formulation are conjugated equine estrogens or CEE. These are the ones that are uh, have an animal source or it may be synthetic. 17 beta estradiol is an estrogen which is structurally identical to the natural estradiol but it is synthetic and ethanyl estradiol which is also synthetic. When these uh, drugs are present in their micronized form they are much easily available, their bioavailability is increased. And the progesterogens that are used commonly are medroxyprogesterone and norethindrone acetate. So let's discuss further more about the forms of hormone therapy. Commonly prescribed hormone therapy is conjugated estrogens and progestin in the form of 0.625 milligrams per deciliter of conjugated equine estrogens and 2.5 milligrams per day of medroxyprogesterone acetate in women with an intact uterus. Conjugated equine estrogens is a preparation which is very useful in the treatment of vasomotor symptoms of menopause, atrophic vaginitis and osteoporosis. Lower dose preparations that contain 1.5 milligrams per day of medroxyprogesterone acetate with either 0.45 milligrams or 0.3 milligrams per day of conjugated equine estrogens are becoming increasingly popular. Dehydroepiandrosterone sulfate and dehydroepiandrosterone are body steroids produced in the adrenal cortex, gonads and brain. Currently, we are not clear about the role that they play but they are now attracting attention as anti-aging supplements 
particularly for postmenopausal women, despite the fact that the research or the evidence for this is inconclusive. Other forms of hormonal therapy include selective estrogen receptor modulators or SERMs. They are a class of non-hormonal drugs that selectively mimic or antagonize the effect of estrogen at various target organ sites. Examples of these drugs are raloxifen, tamoxifen and clomiphene. These drugs will act as an anti-estrogen to reduce estrogenic stimulation in the breast but as an estrogen agonist in other parts of the body. It improves bone density, but may increase the risk of endometrial cancer and deep vein thrombosis. SERMs have a beneficial effect on bone and cholesterol metabolism and can be offered as an alternative to traditional hormonal therapy for prevention and treatment of osteoporosis in postmenopausal women. Indications for hormone therapy include the following. So the main indication is that if the patient has symptoms of menopause or if she wants to prevent symptoms of menopause, then these are the two strong indications for which hormonal therapy is prescribed. The common clinical settings in which hormone therapy is prescribed is described as below. Firstly, vasomotor symptoms, which are, uh, which are uh, hot flushes, sweating, and palpitations. The effectiveness of this treatment was proven in placebo-controlled randomized studies. Urogenital symptoms. Both topical and systemic estrogens have been shown to improve the menopausal symptoms of vaginal dryness, superficial dyspareunia, urinary frequency, and urgency. Patients have to take long-term treatment, and once they stop the treatment, the symptoms will reoccur. Osteoporosis is another important indication as one in three postmenopausal women will develop osteoporosis. So hormone therapy appears to be particularly effective if it is started during the first five years after the onset of menopause. Women who benefit most from hormonal therapy to prevent menopause are women who already have a bone mineral density decreased at the start of menopause, who have a history of osteoporotic fractures, and women with premature menopause. Once women stop using hormones, they will lose the protection that they are, the hormones are providing. As far as the contraindications for hormonal therapy is concerned, there are no absolute contraindications. However, it is relatively contraindicated in certain clinical situations, such as a history of breast cancer, endometrial cancer, a history of porphyria, which is a sensitivity to the sun and sometimes even to artificial light, severe active liver disease or hypertriglyceridemia, thromboembolic disorders, undiagnosed vaginal bleeding, presence of endometriosis or the presence of fibroids. Clinicians will not prescribe hormone therapy to women who have a previous history of breast or endometrial cancer. We are now going to talk about two important studies which have shaped the way that we manage patients currently when they have achieved menopause. The first study was the Women's Health Initiative that was undertaken in 1991. It was the largest study of its kind and this initiative involved double-blind, randomized, controlled trials involving about 161,000 healthy post-menopausal women aged between 50 to 79 years. These three clinical trials conducted at the same American centers were designed to test the effect 
of menopausal hormone therapy, diet modification, and calcium and vitamin D supplementation on heart disease, osteoporotic fractures, and breast and colorectal cancer. In the study, one arm consisted of about 10,000 women who had undergone a hysterectomy. They received estrogen alone. In the other arm, about 16,000 women received combined estrogen and progestogen. The study was to have continued until 2005, but it was stopped early in 2002 because the investigators observed an increased risk of breast cancer and because the overall risk of the hormones outweighed their benefits since the study was started. Reanalysis of the, world, the Women's Health Initiative data by age cohort showed that the risks of breast cancer, stroke, and heart disease were not increased in the fifth decade, but rose when women were 60 years and 70 years old. The breast cancer risk was apparent in women exposed to hormone therapy before they entered the Women's Health Initiative study after a washout period. But this was not seen in those who had never received hormone therapy. Another important study was the Million Women Study in the United Kingdom. But this was different from the Women's Health Initiative because this was an observational study. This provided information about a diverse range of hormonal therapy regimens, with the exception of vaginal preparations in women between the ages of 50 to 64 years. And these were women who were attending the National Health Service breast screening program. So what did we find in these studies? We found that hormone therapy is associated with certain adverse effects that are transient and that usually resolve. The patient should be forewarned to prevent their discontinuation of therapy. These effects include nausea, bloating, weight gain, fluid retention, mood swings, which are associated with the use of relatively androgenic progestogens, breakthrough bleeding, breast tenderness. We even found that there are certain adverse effects which can be more undesirable and these include the following. Breast cancer, endometrial cancer and uterine hyperplasia and uterine cancer, and thromboembolism and biliary pathology. As far as endometrial cancer is concerned, this is a transient adverse effect and recently evidence from randomized control studies shows a definite association between hormonal therapy and uterine hyperplasia and cancer. This observed risk, which is unlike the increased risk of breast disease, is linked with combined rather than unopposed hormone therapy. Continuous combined regimens have not been associated with an increased risk. Thromboembolism has also been noted as a transient adverse effect and various studies have shown an increased risk of thromboembolism with hormone therapy. The Women's Health Initiative study showed combined hormone therapy increased the risk of venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism in 15 per 10,000 women per year. The risk of venous thrombosis increased for women given an estrogen only regimen but their risk of developing pulmonary emboli was not statistically significant. Transdermal hormone therapy may be associated with a lowered risk. There is also a risk of biliary pathology. So women who are postmenopausal already have a higher chance of polylithiasis, and especially if they are obese. But in various studies, including the Women's Health Initiative, this risk has further increased in postmenopausal women receiving hormone therapy. Okay. Although studies have been inconsistent, an emerging consensus appears to suggest 
that hormonal therapy given during menopause may slightly increase the risk for breast cancer. This risk is associated with natural late menopause and it comes into effect after at least five years of continuous hormone therapy. Mammographic density also increases in about 25% of women who use either cyclical or continuous combined hormone therapy. This has been evidenced in a randomized placebo controlled study. The degree of density increases 5%. Unopposed estrogen and tibolone have no significant effect. There are certain effects of hormone therapy which are believed to be uncertain because there is not enough evidence to show that this is absolutely true. And some of these uncertain effects include the following. The Women's Health Initiative study revealed an increased annual risk of heart attacks of 7 per 10,000 women who took combined therapy as opposed to women who took estrogen alone. And in these women, no significant difference was noted. The Women's Health Initiative study also showed that continuous combined hormone therapy may slightly increase the risk of ovarian cancer. Part of the Women's Health Initiative memory study revealed a heightened risk of dementia in women aged 65 years or older who took combination of hormone therapy. At present, there is no definite evidence which supports the use of hormone therapy to prevent or to improve cognitive deterioration. So an important point to note is that since 1991, over 30 years have passed since the study was started and was then stopped prematurely. But even to date, the data is so rich that it is still being, still being studied and results are coming out to show the, result, the effects of hormone therapy on different aspects of women's physical stress and uh, to some extent uh, other kinds of health as well. For example, dementia. With this, we come to the end of this particular video. If you like the video, then please subscribe to the channel. Press the like button. This is very important for continuation of the channel. Share with friends and colleagues. Pass your comments so that we can improve and also provide further videos which you want to see. And press the bell icon so that you are notified of future videos from this channel. Thank you and goodbye.